our sacred place. And this, this is a sacred moment. And we indeed are standing on holy ground. Now I know for me and others with family coming in and the gifts and all of the rush of the holiday season, that may still cling to us. So I want us to take a moment to center ourselves. And this morning we're going to sing, we're going to learn a simple hymn of praise to settle our spirits. We are standing on holy ground. We are Jeconiah was the father of 
Zalathio, Zalathio, the father of Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel, the father of Ab Abiud, and Abiud, the father of Eliakim, and Eliakim, the father of Azor, and Azor, the father of Z Zadok, and Zadok, the father of Akim, and Akim, the father of Eliud, and Eliud, the father of Eleazar, and Eleazar, the father of Matham, and Matham, the father of Jacob, and Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called the Messiah. The word of God for the people of God.
location, location, location. It makes a difference where you were born, economically, socially, and historically. So while the church looks to Mary, the world is looking at Megan, Duchess of Sussex, awaiting a world birth. The paparazzi are waiting, the news trucks are buzzing, the commentators commenting, and millions waiting to get a glimpse of what the future might hold. I mean, we're fascinated by the lives of the rich and famous. We want to see what the union of beauty, privilege, and more money than most of us can imagine, what will that bring forth? But for most of us, the birth of a child is a very private matter of utmost importance to the family and community they enter while the world keeps going on. I mean, think about when you were born. Think about where you were born. For all the things we would like to control in life, none of us have ever been able to choose the moment in history that we were born. Some of us were born into Damascus or Mexico or Germany. Some of us were born into situations of a loving family with all our needs being met. And some of us were born into chaos and continuous wanting. These are things we did not choose, but were chosen for us. And children are born into ethnic groups and social location and levels of love and dysfunction through no fault of their own. So just by virtue of one's parentage, the gift of life is not always treated as a gift. Sometimes a burden, sometimes a profound inconvenience. But whatever our birth story is, each arrival is filled with anticipation of a new beginning. Anticipating what will the future look like. And here we are, Advent. Advent is a season of anticipation while we wait for this thing that is going to be born anew, waiting for something new to emerge. Hope when things seem pretty hopeless. Love when there's so much hate. Peace when there's so much violence. Here we are celebrating innocent new life coming into the world with some uneasiness because we know the world really doesn't want to make room for hope being born, especially hope being born from the margins, where we don't deem people as being quite worthy. But today is when we anticipate one who was chosen from the margins to come through all these generations to show us another way. And in two days, we celebrate the birth of Christ. So how do we discern if this birth is important or worthy to be celebrated? How do we know if we should be in awe or not? Well, Matthew answers this even before we get to the birth of Christ. For the first page, of this reading today, it reads like a Hebrew ancient phone book. I know some of you don't even know what a phone book is, but it <laughs> reads like an ancient phone book. Matthew begins his gospel with a genealogy that most people just skip. But it's there for an important reason. Clause after clause, we have this monotonous list till we finally read Jacob was the father of Joseph, and Joseph was the husband of Mary, and Mary was the mother of Jesus, and Jesus is called the Christ. 
But why did we go through all that trouble? Who gave us this boring list of names to wade through, and why is it considered worthy to be in our sacred texts? Well, first, genealogies were important to the Jewish people. They were extremely important. As a matter of fact, if you had been a priest or the priestly line, you would have realized how important it was because before you could be a priest, you had to produce an unbroken record that your pedigree showed that you deserved that you were born into this office. And furthermore, if you were to marry a priest, it would be necessary for the wife to produce, to produce an unbroken record in her pedigree that stretched back at least five generations. So it was very important to have a pure genealogy. And the second reason, Matthew wrote this gospel in large part to the Jewish people to prove that Jesus was indeed the long-awaited Messiah who fulfilled the Old Testament promises. He wanted to point out that the genealogy of Jesus is both pure and that it is traceable. It's important to list the important men of the past with whom he was connected. And especially this princely genealogy that is related to King David. And ultimately, Abraham, the father of the faithful. So this genealogy was really like his resume. And back then, just like now, resumes were fudged to include the best parts and omit some of the nasty parts. They were crafted to think, wow, this guy has awesome in his blood. And in the ancient world, they had waited 400 years for the coming of the anointed one, the one they were hoping was going to be their king. But yet, let's look closely at this genealogy. Tamar and David and Ruth the Moabite, not even Jewish. Rahab, not only a foreigner, but a prostitute. Manasseh, one of the most wicked and godless kings in Israel's history. Jesus' line is filled with outsiders and scandal of every kind. Yet at the same time, he's the one they've been waiting for. A strange mix of scandal and awesome in his blood. This strange genealogy of Jesus is not uniformly holy anymore that it's very uniformly royal. And the fascinating part of Matthew's genealogy is the inclusion of women, which was uncommon, which was unheard of. It was not the custom, but yet he does it here. Even more intriguing is the type of women who are mentioned as members of Jesus' own family. Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, Bathsheba, and Mary. So while we have a detailed account of the royal lineage from Abraham to King David, we also have a list of disturbing ancestors. I mean, Tamar is like a Jerry Springer plot in Genesis 38. She slept with her father-in-law. Jerry, Jerry. <laughs> Rahab was a prostitute who eventually became the great, great grandmother of King David. And Ruth was the result of incest and married Boaz and became King David's great grandmother. Bathsheba committed adultery with King David and became his wife and the mother of King Solomon. And lastly, Mary, she was a poor Mary had a bad reputation. Joseph obeyed the Lord and married her. 
and adopted Jesus and became his dad. But throughout their life, people didn't quite believe Mary's story. And many believed that she was sinful, perverted, and just a liar. This is who was in Jesus' family, a strange mix of scandal and awesome running through his veins. So what's the good news of that text? The good news is that even with some questionable relatives, God can still use you by opening this book with an honest account of Jesus' heritage, Matthew, the tax extortionist turned pastor, is telling us that there is room for all of us in God's family by grace. God can use you no matter your history or your pedigree, no matter what ancestor Ancestry.com says, God can use you. There is room for men and women, for rich and poor, for young and old, for moral and even the immoral, for Jew and Gentile, for perverted and virgin, for religious and irreligious, for liars and truth tellers, even murderers and their victims. All are included in this, in God's family by grace. Even if you were born outside in a barn, that is no indicator of what God has destined for you. The old preachers used to say God can take a crooked stick and hit a straight lick. This genealogy confirms that it isn't what's in your blood that matters. It's what's in your spirit. For we serve a God who makes a way out of no way. We serve a God of possibility and promise. So aren't you glad? That is what we're anticipating. That is what we're waiting for. That is why the church is waiting while the world has been celebrating Christmas since Halloween. But that is why we wait and we ponder and we think about it. Because we are anticipating what new thing can be born. We're remembering what comes from the margins, from low down places, from people with questionable backgrounds. That's the power of the story. And that only a few people, three, were wise enough to look in that disturbing circumstance and see something holy that might just save the world. That's what we celebrate. And it's amazing. So you should be glad. I'm glad that we're never too far away from God. We're never too far down in our own mess. We're not even too far down in our own self-absorbed involvement for God to reach us. This season is about God sending us a divine message. You are loved. You are valued. No matter what your baby mama or baby daddy drama may be. It is the Sunday before Christmas. And here we are anticipating the birth of the anointed one. Waiting for the coming of Emmanuel, God with us, wrapped in flesh. Born in a mess of a place, a stable. Born in a mess of a family. But we wait and we're glad to celebrate this holy gift of possibility and hope in the form of a newborn babe conceived by the Holy Spirit. We celebrate because 
Someone is being delivered. Someone is coming to us. Someone is coming to preach the gospel to the poor. Someone is coming to us to preach deliverance to the captives, to recover sight to the blind, and to set at liberty all those who are bruised. Someone is coming to us, and his name shall be Emmanuel, God with us. So this Christmas we celebrate God's gift to us, delivered in such an ordinary package. A poor baby, delivered to people living very ordinary lives, no paparazzi, no commentators, nobody really cares. So this Christmas, let us look to the world with new eyes, knowing while your past has shaped you and has given you your distinct flavor, it doesn't have to define you, but it can impact what comes through you. Justice can come through you. Peace can come through you. Love can come through you. And the healing of this world can come through you and you and you. And it doesn't matter to God what you did or didn't do and who your mother was or if you know your father or not. That's what we celebrate this season. So each of us, let us marvel at where God has placed our feet. And let us be reminded it's not who we are, but whose we are, children of the Most High God. The good news of the gospel is your circumstances don't define all of who you are. All we have to do is to connect to God's will for our lives. And let us be brave enough to look for God in the margins. And let us allow God to place something that powerful inside of us to impregnate us so that that hope, that peace, that yearning can grow inside of us until we deliver it into the world, no matter what your circumstance. So let, let us be open this season. Let us be watchful enough, open enough, to see the glory of God manifest in ordinary places. Amen. Amen.